Now you've joined us for week four of our series, Face to Face, where we've been unpacking the wonderful and wacky dynamics that make up relationships. Now we are all in relationships, whether you're a husband, a wife, a father, a daughter, a son, a brother, a colleague, a a business partner, or all of the above. We are all in relationships. And as complex as they are, they are actually the lifeblood of our society and community. And the truth is, none of us have perfect relationships, but we can all have good, strong, healthy, godly relationships if we choose to apply God's wisdom to our lives. And as you may have already heard, in this series, we are using the metaphor of a face to unpack four unique dynamics about our relationships, the way we see, the way we think, the way we hear, and to continue our conversation today, we're going to be looking at the way we speak, the power of the tongue. Now, if you've been alive for longer than 15 minutes, you would be well aware that relational connection begins with communication. Without conversation, your husband or your wife would most likely just be a stranger. So our words have huge implications to the relationships that we hold dear. In fact, King Solomon, who according to the Bible was the wisest man to ever live, which if you ask me is a pretty good title to hold, says in Proverbs 18.21, the tongue has the power of life and death. In other words, this little thing in our mouths has a significant amount of power to influence our lives and the lives of those around us. In James 3, Eugene Peterson's message paraphrase reads this, A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest of winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. Oof, that's a heavy scripture this morning. James 3 prompts us that whilst our tongues may be small, they have the power to bring harmony or chaos, delight or destruction. In our mouths, we hold both the power of life and of death. And if King Solomon and James are right, and I think they are, we need God's wisdom for the way that we speak. So with that in mind, let's take a moment to pray and we're gonna dive on in. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for another opportunity to gather under your name. We thank you so much that when we do gather, Lord, you speak to us, that you're alive and at work in our community. So Lord, would these words this morning not be my own? Would these not be my own ideas, but things that you wanna speak to us about? Lord, we pray that as we dive into your word, it would take deep root in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, As I mentioned a little bit earlier, for the last year or so, I have been living overseas in a little country called Canada. And I moved over there to pursue a a theological education. And whilst I was there, I was re-reminded that Australia truly is the greatest country on the planet. Can I get an amen out there? And for those of you who have lived overseas or, or moved away before, you would be very familiar that very quickly there are some things that you begin to miss about home. You begin to miss about home. The first thing that I began to miss, much to my own surprise, was the beautiful smell and taste of an Australian sausage sizzle. Man, the Bunnings Warehouse sausage sizzles were the holy grail of all of my Canadian cravings. There is something so good about a slightly over, overcooked mystery meat sausage and some plain old tip-top white bread. That was a surprise to me, I know. The the next thing I began to miss really quickly was the taste of Australian coffee. Oh, praise Jesus for Australian coffee. If you've done any traveling, you would be well aware that there are some places you can go in the world that you can go hundreds of miles without getting a good cup of coffee. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. I, I genuinely think as Australians, we ought to be a blessing to the nations when it comes to caffeine. 
And, and the, the next thing I began to miss, much to my own surprise, was the iconic sound of the infamous Australian accent. The uh, g'day mate of your local shopping trolley pusher. The oi of the guy in traffic behind you. The uh, yeah, nah, yeah, yeah, nah, of the person out at the cafe serving you this morning. I, I didn't realise that I would begin to miss that accent. And it began to occur to me that my accent was very different to that of a Canadian. For the first time in my life, I began to hear my own accent. And so whilst I was studying, I was working part-time in a cafe as a barista. And whilst I was working, I began to notice the way I spoke. They would say, water. I would say, water. <laughs> they would say, oh, hi. They <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I would say, how are you going? And I began to hear my own accent and it began to occur to me that I could stand next to a bunch of Canadians, we could hang out and you wouldn't be able to pick me until I spoke. Why? Because our accent reveals something. Our accent reveals something deeper. In this instance, the g'day mate, the yeah, nah, reveals where I am from. And, and I think this is true of accents in a natural sense, but I actually think it's true in a spiritual sense. Jesus in Luke 6 says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus is saying your accent, the way you speak, your tone, your words reveal something deeper, something of your heart. In context, it reads, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes, grapes from briars, needles from strawberries. That's, to that's topical. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus is saying that what comes out of your mouth is a reflection of what's in your heart. You see, if I was to pick up an apple this morning and begin yelling at it for what it is, two things would happen. Firstly, you would think I'm crazy because I'm yelling at an apple, and that's a fair assessment. Secondly, you would understand that it is extremely counterintuitive. Why? Because an apple is a product of an apple tree. So there's no point in me picking up an apple and yelling at it, wishing it was an orange. I need to go to the source. I need to go to the tree. And although that might seem like a strange illustration, we might laugh at it, the scary thing is we do that with our words. We do that with our words. If we really want to see the fruit change, we actually need to look at the tree. If we really want to see our words change, we need to look at our hearts. You notice Jesus says that good trees produce good fruit. It's not created. It's not attempted. An, an apple tree isn't trying to squeeze out an apple. An apple is the unconscious byproduct of an apple tree. In the same way, our accent, our words, our tone, the way we speak is a byproduct of our heart. So in order for us to tame the tongue, in the words of James, and speak with an accent of life, we need to go a little bit deeper than just our words and look at our hearts. So today we're going to be performing a little bit of a heart check, a diagnosis, if you will. And I want to begin a conversation on some attitudes of the heart that will come out of your mouth. Some attitudes of the heart that will come out of your mouth. Now, in no way is this an exhaustive list. In fact, this list is one that's from my own experiences, from my own life and from my own relationships and ultimately from my own heart. And these attitudes are often the unconscious byproduct of who I am. Now, I don't necessarily like them. I'm not proud of this list and I'm working on changing them, but I thought it would be great to have a real conversation this morning. And if they help you, fantastic. But whilst I've got the microphone, let me indulge myself a little bit. And we're going to take a look at some of the instinctive attitudes of Ryan Gagler's heart. 
Firstly, the accent that comes out of my mouth often reveals my insecurity. Insecurity. The lack of belief I have in myself, the envy or the jealousy I feel, the comparison game I play in my head, all leads to me having an insecure heart. See, whether you realise it or not, insecurity will come out of your mouth. Insecurity will come out of your mouth. The words I say to my employee, the words you say to your son or your daughter will be influenced by your own insecurity. Am I enough? What do people think about me? How do I compare? Man, I, I indulge my insecurity far too often and I hate it. Because the jealousy and the envy that I feel, the comparison game I play, all produces bad fruit. It results in me speaking poorly to people and results in me speaking poorly about people. Now the passage we just read in Luke, the word Jesus says and is recorded as bad could possibly more accurately be translated as rotten. It's the Greek word sapros. We're learning a little bit of Greek this morning. Everyone say sapros. So Jesus is reminding us that good trees don't produce rotten fruit. Now I've got an image on the screen here of a lovely apple. It's a little bit rotten. It's decayed a little. Now many studies have been done about the ripening and decay that we witness on the very fruit bowl of your kitchen counter. You see, most fruits release ethylene, which is a gas known as the ripening hormone. In a fruit bowl, exposure to ethylene can both speed up the ripening process, but it can also speed up decay and rotting. In fact, it's the ethylene gas that's behind the age-old expression, one bad apple spoiled the bunch. Now, this is an experience I am all too familiar with. My own rotten, insecure accent has the potential to rot other people. And can we be real this morning? I hate that I love gossip. I hate that I love gossip. Because I think that accent is actually so far from the good intention that God has for our lives. Now, you might say to me this morning, but Ryan, you don't understand. People just always come to me and they want to gossip. They just always come to me and want to gossip. I'm going to say to you, the chances are you're the rotten fruit. If people come to me to indulge their own insecurity, to talk about their own jealousy, their own envy, I need to take responsibility for my own decay and stop the rot. In the same way that bad apples spoil other apples, an accent of insecurity will wreak destruction and decay in our relationships. Secondly, the, the accent that spills out of my heart often reveals my pride. And seriously, this one gets me. This one gets me. You have to understand about me. One thing you have to understand about me is I love being right and I love knowing everything. Please, please pray for my girlfriend, Renee. She has to put up with my own ego, my own inability to be wrong. And pride is something that I battle with and I'm consistently battling with because I notice that it actually has, I, I jeopardise my own relationships with it. And pride, the same as insecurity, will come out of your mouth. Whether you like it or not, your pride will come out of your mouth. And if, if you don't believe it, go and ask your partner if they see pride in you and enjoy that conversation. Because it's not something we often see in the mirror or if we do see it, we just ignore it. Am I more interested in being righteous or in being right? Are we more concerned about being in right relationships or about being right? Sometimes we're so concerned with winning an argument that we would threaten our own relationships. It's crazy. Like I constantly need to ask myself, am I too filled with my own ego to apologise? Am I too filled with my own ego to apologise? Because I never, ever, ever want to get too big or too full of myself to say sorry. And if you find it hard saying sorry, maybe you, like me, need to have a bit of a heart check this morning. Now, here's the crazy thing. What we say can turn harmony into chaos, but also what we don't say can turn harmony into chaos. Pride will prevent you from saying what you need to say. 
You know, when someone did a fantastic job at something, but you're still annoyed that you didn't have the opportunity, pride will come out of your mouth, either as a snarky comment or as silence. You know, I think we, we really ought to embrace a vulnerable conversation more often. Often our own ego restricts us from saying what we need to say. We really should tell our kids how proud we are of them. We really should tell our parents how grateful we are for everything they've done. We really should tell our partners how much we love them. Tell our colleagues how appreciative we are, how grateful we are to our friends. It's, it's crazy that we, we run from those conversations. You know, it, it's so sad that sometimes we have to wait for people's funerals to say something nice about them to embrace the vulnerable conversation. You know, I think we ought to swallow our pride more often and have those conversations because an accent of pride will tear holes in our relationships. Now, the third attitude that that shapes my accent is this one, complacency. And you might see this and go, "How, how did that make the list? Well, complacency is something I've realized more than ever in coming back home to Australia. You see, here in Australia, we have a thing we call tall poppy syndrome. And tall poppy syndrome is all about cutting down those who get too high. And let me explain. If someone in Australia begins to succeed, if someone in Australia begins to get better, if someone begins to improve, we cut them down. And you know, the truth is, that is the opposite of the intention that God has for our relationships. That is the opposite. Far too often I say, well, they're just like that. That's just who Aaron is. And I laugh off the idea that he can improve. He can change. He can get better. You know, when that friend comes to you in your connect group and they struggle to be consistent, they come to you and say they want to start a new Bible reading plan. How do you respond? Do you encourage them? Do you pray for them? Do you believe in them? Or do you shrug it off, joke about it, and rebuke the idea that they can actually change? I want to ask you a hard question this morning. Do you truly believe people can change? And do you allow people to change? An accent of complacency will actually limit those around us from becoming all that God has intended them to be. You see, in John 8, uh, you probably heard the story before. Jesus has an interaction with a woman caught in the act of adultery. So it, it's pretty messy. Anyway, Jesus is, is getting egged on by these Jewish leaders to take action and to punish the woman. And after Jesus gets rid of all the Jewish leaders for being hypocrites, he has a stunning interaction with this woman. Now you notice Jesus doesn't say, well... That's just Sandra. That's just what she's like. She's a sinner. It's who she is. It's what what she does. No, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus never calls anyone a sinner. He just calls us lost. What does he do? He firstly says to her, hey, there is no condemnation. And then he encourages change. He speaks transformation. He says, you can do it. Give it another go. Church, we cannot allow our accent to be influenced by our own complacency. As Christians and as committed followers of Jesus, we are in the business of change. We don't settle for who we are and where we're at. We are into transformation. People are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit and praise God for that. Now, I don't know what Accents stem from your own heart. Maybe for you, your struggle isn't with pride, it's with anger or something else. But I really think it's important that we check our hearts this morning because these attitudes, my attitude of insecurity, of pride, of complacency, all result in me speaking with an accent of death. And in my own life, no matter how hard I tried or what I did, I cannot change and could not change my own accent. I could not produce in myself an accent of life. But fortunately, from the very beginning, God had a plan. It's uncomfortable, but it's the only thing that will change us. It's the only thing that will produce in us an accent of life. And it's this, it's a heart transplant. 
It's a heart transplant. God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel about His chosen people says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God is saying that we need a new heart. We actually need a new heart. My heart of stone, of death, of insecurity, of pride, of complacency needs to be taken out and replaced with one that beats. Now, the beautiful thing is that because of the redeeming work of Jesus Christ on a cross, we can, and many of us have, received a new heart. Now, I'm no heart surgeon or medical expert, but one thing I do know is that when someone receives a new heart, they aren't just given the green light and the thumbs up to go and do whatever they want. No, they're their life needs to align with their new heart. So someone receives a new heart, they don't just go out to KFC and slam down a bucket of finger licking chicken. They don't go and run a marathon straight away. No, their life needs to align with their new heart. And you see, as followers of Jesus, by the grace of God, through faith, we receive a new heart and thus we are justified. Can I get an amen this morning? But that is not the end of the journey. That is not the end of the journey. Our lives are slowly but surely transformed to align with our new heart. We begin to live with a renewed heart. And this process is called sanctification. So justification, we receive a new heart. Sanctification, we live with a renewed heart. You see, it's, it's one thing to have an encounter with Jesus. It's another thing to encounter Jesus. Saul in Acts 9 has his Damascus Road experience, a moment in which he encounters Jesus. But even after his Damascus Road experience, his journey and encounter with Jesus wasn't done. He, in his own words, was being renewed day by day. King David, in recognising his own inability and the depth of his own brokenness, prayed this prayer in Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David recognised that he couldn't renew his heart alone. He needed the Almighty God to transform him. So, how's your heart? Are you being renewed day by day? How often are we praying the prayer of David that God would create in us a new heart and renew us? The truth of the matter is it needs to be our daily prayer because it is our consistent interaction with God that changes us. When I first moved to to Vancouver to a new city, I noticed a lot of different accents, but I also noticed different phrases. Certain phrases that the locals would use to say the same things I would say, but with different words. And there were a couple of them that sounded ridiculous. Parkade was what they called a car park. What? Washrooms was what they called the place that you go and do your business. The the dunny, as we would so eloquently call it. And I remember when I first arrived, I thought they sounded ridiculous. And due to my own stubbornness, I said, there is no way I will speak like that. But slowly but surely, day by day, my language began to shift. I began to say, hello, excuse me, where is your washroom? In fact, I noticed when I came back to Australia, I asked someone where the washroom was. Why? Because what you surround yourself with consistently will transform you. What you surround yourself with consistently will transform you. In the same way, it's our daily interaction with God that will change us. We are sanctified, we are renewed through the daily bread, as Jesus calls calls it. You see, following Jesus isn't a momentary decision. It's an everyday decision. It's a decision decision to encounter Jesus, then encounter Jesus, then encounter Jesus, then encounter Jesus, and then encounter Jesus. You see, we are renewed. I am being renewed and my acts 
mindset is being transformed by my daily interaction with God. Church, if we are to look and to sound like Jesus, we need to spend time with Him. There's no getting around that. There's no alternative to sit, to pray, to worship, to know Him and be known by Him. Spend time discovering who He is. We do that through reading the Bible, but so often we make the Bible a story about us, but it's not a story about us. It's a story about God, a story about His goodness, His faithfulness, His love, His mercy, His grace and His glory. If you call yourself a Christian by nature, you've based your whole life on Jesus of Nazareth. I actually think it's pretty important that you know who it is you're following. This Jesus Christ that you've committed your entire life to, who is He? What is He like? We ought to know. Now, if you spend more time watching The Bachelor than you do with Jesus, that's a problem. If you identify as a Christian, you ought to know Jesus. And the great news this morning is that as you discover Jesus, He will renew your heart. As you discover Jesus, He will renew your heart. So then whilst our hearts are being renewed day by day, the question then becomes, what does the accent of a healthy, renewed heart sound like? Well, I think the Apostle Paul provides us with a glimpse. He says in Ephesians 4.29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, firstly, it's interesting to note that the Greek word Paul uses for unwholesome is, guess what? Sapros, rotten. So Paul is telling us that we shouldn't allow rotten talk to come out of our mouths. Don't speak with an accent of death, but with one of life. Now, earlier in his letter to the Ephesians, he introduces us to this idea of speaking the truth in love. And that is a powerful and significant idea. But the question is, what does it sound like? What does it look like? You know, growing up as the youngest of brothers, of, of two older brothers, we, like many siblings, would get into arguments and heated debates about pretty much anything. Uh, they would begin about who was the best at roller hockey or who got to play as Australia on Shane Warne Cricket 97 or uh, who got to eat the last Calippo in the freezer. But very quickly, they would escalate and turn personal. You're fat, you're ugly, you're dumb, you're slow. And I remember our mum would always rush in, scuffle in. And she would say, wise words, the mantra of a generation. If you don't have anything nice to say, what is it? Don't say anything at all. Now, if you've got kids, it's not a bad place to start, but adults can, we be honest, that we can't live like that. We actually can't live like that because as followers of Jesus, we're not just about nice. We're about love. We're about truth and we're about life. So what Paul is suggesting to us in his letter is that if you don't have building or beneficial things to say, don't say anything at all. An accent of life flowing from a renewed heart builds up and benefits others. It understands the needs of others and speaks accordingly. It's not concerned about my needs or indulging my insecurity or my pride. It builds up and benefits others. Now, a disclaimer, sometimes building up isn't always nice. The loving thing to say and the nice thing to say aren't always the same thing. Constantly telling people what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear, isn't beneficial. So we are nice, but we're not just about nice. We're about love and truth. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying that building and benefiting is to be done without kindness, compassion and discernment. It needs to be done with godly wisdom, but an accent of life will speak the truth in love in order to build up and benefit others. 
Now, notice as well, Paul says this is to be done according to their needs. That means building and benefiting, speaking the truth in love is to be done in the context of committed relationships. So if you're sitting there rubbing your hands together, getting ready to give someone a serve of truth, can I suggest this morning that if you don't know the situation, if you're not aware of the circumstance, if you don't know the needs, maybe you should keep quiet. It is to be done according to their needs. Not only should our speech build up, it ought to benefit others. In other words, it's helpful, it's specific, it's constructive. An accent of life speaks renewal. So the fruit of our accent ought to build up and benefit those we are in relationship with. You see, true godly relationships will move us to places that we could not move ourselves. The words that come out of your mouth, our accent, or to move people to places they could not reach alone. And the good news this morning is by the grace of God, people can change. I'm testament to that. My accent of death is slowly but surely being renewed into an accent of life because I'm being transformed by God day by day. Jesus would demonstrate this consistently. He would take people who were lost, who were broken, and who were just average and transform them into something they could never be by themselves. And that is what our tongues ought to do. You see, in Jesus, we witness what it truly looks like to live. In Jesus, we find our identity. In Jesus, we find our security. In Jesus... We witness extraordinary humility that the God of heaven would trade in His glory to be obedient even to death on a cross. In Jesus, we see a faithful God who is committed to His people. And in Jesus, we see our own stories, lives and relationships transformed. And consistently, the question that Jesus asks us, it's not about what you know, It's not about how much you've read your Bible. It's not about how good you are. It is, are you willing to change? Are you willing to change? If you are committed to being transformed, to being renewed and living a life aligned with His purposes and power, church, He is faithful to His end. He is faithful to His end. Man, Jesus is so, so good. So an accent of life, one that builds up and benefits others, is the product of a healthy heart. If we are to speak love, truth, goodness, encouragement, we first need to look at our hearts. Good fruit is the result of a good tree. Healthy relationships stem from healthy communication and healthy communication stems from a healthy heart. As King Solomon said, the tongue has the power of life and death. It'll determine the destiny or the destruction of our relationships, harmony or chaos. So my question to you today is what accent do you speak with? Life or death? And in the case of the latter, are we willing to change? Are we willing to change? You know, The reality is that both medically and spiritually, you cannot perform your own heart operation. You cannot perform your own heart operation. You can try, you can try, you can try, but you cannot renew your own heart. Only God can do that. And as He does, the accent of your life, the product of your mouth will change from death to life. We cannot renew our own heart but we do need to go in and have our hearts checked. We cannot renew our own heart, but we do need to open ourselves up to the Creator God who can renew us and change us. So we're gonna take a moment this morning to pray together, to repent of some of the attitudes of the heart that spill out of our mouths, but also to ask God to help us renewing our hearts. We're we're not just playing church games on a Sunday morning. This is real. And it will determine the destiny of your life. 
Jesus has so much good in store for us, but we need to be willing to step in and meet Him. So let's pray together this morning. Why don't you join with me? Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank You first and foremost for Jesus. We thank You that it's in Him we find life. It's in Him we find truth. And it's in Him that we are renewed and transformed day by day. Heavenly Father, we just want to take a moment to repent of the attitudes of heart that stem out of our mouth. Lord, for insecurity, for pride, for complacency, for anger, for whatever it is in our hearts, Lord, we repent. We say that we're sorry. And Lord, we recognise this morning that we cannot change our own hearts. We can't produce an accent of life, but we can know You. And Lord, Your promise to us is that as we know You, You will renew us. So help us to do that, Lord. Give us a hunger, give us a desire to seek after You every day, to be committed to being renewed day by day. Help us, Lord. Help us to handle our relationships well. Would the words out of our mouths sound like the words out of Jesus' mouth that would help transform, that would help change, that would help lift up, that would help encourage, that would help build up and benefit. Lord, would those around us because of our words be in places they could not get alone? God, we thank You so much for what it is You're doing this morning. We, we hand our relationships to You. We ask that You would inhabit the speech that comes out of our mouth. That because of that, our community would be stronger. Our relationships would be stronger. And ultimately, we would look and sound more and more like Jesus. That is our prayer this morning. And we pray it in His death-conquering name. Amen. Amen.